there are different types of scoliosis. One type is known as early onset scoliosis. What early onset scoliosis means is, in contrast to adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, which typically occurs in the teenage years, early onset scoliosis occurs in children oftentimes very young, sometimes as old as two or three years of, of age. The issues related to that is that anything that affects the spine also affects the lung development. So if you have a spinal deformity, say for example, at a very young age, that's going to impair your long-term lung development and, and pulmonary function. So it's a relatively rare subset of patients with scoliosis, but a very important subset because what you do as a spine surgeon has very dramatic implications for them long-term in terms of their pulmonary function and sometimes even survival. So within early onset scoliosis, there's a tremendous spectrum of, of patients. So for example, some children are born uh, with multiple developmental problems right from birth, and that's a fairly straightforward diagnosis to make. Oftentimes these are associated with heart defects or kidney defects, so things that would bring the child to medical attention. Other times it's relatively subtle, and there's a lot of variability in newborns, especially for a first-time parent. And so some of these things don't become apparent until a child starts to sit up at six months of age or begin walking at the age of one. So one of the difficulties with early onset scoliosis is it's an age-based criteria, but within that there's a huge spectrum uh, from kids who are very severely involved to some that are relatively asymptomatic. I would say in the, the early child, the child that before the age of walking, a lot of it, the parents will notice, say, an asymmetry. They may notice a lump on the child's spine, or that the child tends to tilt one way more than the other. But again, it's very difficult at that age. Once a child begins to stand or walk, it's much easier for a parent to notice asymmetry, say, between the left and right side or things like that. But I think early on, parents may notice a lump or a bump or some difference in, uh, in the spine, uh, say, for example, when they're giving the child a bath or when they're getting them dressed. I think in, in this condition, I think early recognition and management is very important because we need to get a baseline. I've seen some children progress very rapidly and need surgical treatment. I've seen other children be relatively stable and go a long time without having, for us having to do anything. I'm, I'm fortunate here, I've been doing this for about 15 years and I've really watched the trend change from early surgery back in the 2000s. So in 2000 we thought intervene early, operate early. We know now that that's probably a difficult strategy because you may be, say, with a 10-year-old who you've operated on six or seven times with another five years to go, and that's very difficult for kids and families. I'd say more recently our strategy is to lay surgery as long as we can, whether that's with observation or bracing or casting. And I think that's a much better solution both for the kids and the families is to delay as long as possible but intervene when necessary. The problem with these deformities are they're driven by growth, and so a two-year-old has tremendous potential for growth. So we're trying to balance allowing the child to grow and get bigger in terms of their lung size and their lung volume, but at the same time not let their spine deformity get out of control where it's going to cause some problems. So I think one of the challenges in this age group is that the curve progression, the way we treat this, is really based too on the underlying etiology. So for example, if a child has multiple congenital deformities, they're, they're born with multiple problems in their spine, this may be a very aggressive disease where without treatment it may be life-threatening. And certainly 20, 30 years ago there were kids that died from their pulmonary disease based on their spine deformity. You may have other children, say, with neuromuscular disease where they're relatively stable and so treatment of the neuromuscular disease may delay what we have to do as surgeons. And you have some other kids we call idiopathic. Again, we don't know what the cause of that is, and those kids may have a relatively benign course. So uh, surgery in this patient population may be anything from life-saving uh, to certainly enhancing quality of life. But this is probably one of the things that we do as a pediatric orthopedist that can actually increase the length of somebody's life or protect somebody's life. One of the difficulties with this group is really knowing how we're doing. What are our long-term outcomes? Because what does my intervention at age two mean to that patient when they're 25 or 30? And so uh, it's not as immediate as, say, fixing a fracture, where six weeks later you know whether you did a good job or not. One of my research interests is in long-term outcomes in patients with congenital scoliosis, and we're heading a multi-center study now around the U.S. looking at 20 and 30-year-olds who were treated as children. And from our early data, it looks like they function relatively well. Uh, because what parents want to know are simple things. Will my child go to school? Will, will my child live independently? Will, will my child be alive? And I think looking into the late teens, early 20s, which is where we're at, most of these patients can live independently and go to school and have relatively healthy lives. And that's, that's very good news for parents. This is very good for parents and surgeons because it's very hard at age two to counsel families about what this is gonna look like when they're adults. So I think one of the advantages here we have at Campbell Clinic is that we're part of a 20 center study group around the US. 
early onset scoliosis is relatively rare, but through the Pediatric Spine Foundation, we're able to collaborate with other institutions around the country. We are constantly looking at best practices, we're sharing data, we're sharing research outcomes. So what that allows us is access to the latest information for these patients, even before it hits the medical journals or the meetings. I'm fortunate to have a peer group of experts around the country and around the world uh, that I can talk to and share ideas with. So that's one of the unique advantages we have here at Campbell Clinic. And I think one of the most rewarding things about this is, is you really establish long-term relationships with these families. This is a child that you see at age two and then you see them go to middle school and then you see them graduate high school. And so one of the rewarding things is you get to be part of their family in a small way over many years. And so as challenging, as difficult as it is, uh, it's probably the most rewarding. And we tell families up front there's going to be some really good times and there's going to be some tough times, but at the end we're going to be fine. And so it's, it's rewarding to be with that family during their toughest time and then celebrate their, their happiest time.